Okay, this is February 6th. This is the fifth Sunday after the Epiphany. And uh, the Sunday after <coughs> Bishop Diane Jordan came to visit. She was fun. Yes, and her prediction was not good. Though. Her prediction? For the Chiefs and the Rams or whatever. Oh. Her football prediction. <laughs> didn't get it right, did no. you? Okay, number 48. <laughs> Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
be with you. Let us pray. Set us free, O God, from the bondage of our sins, and give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known to us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a pool of among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep listening, but do not comprehend. Keep looking, but do not understand. Make the mind of this people dull, and stop their ears and shut their eyes, so that they may not look with their eyes and listen with their ears and comprehend with their minds and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and the land is utterly desolate until the Lord sends everyone far away, and vast is the emptiness in the midst of the land. Even if a tenth part remain in it, it will be burned again, like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains standing when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm is Psalm 138, found in your bulletin, and uh, we'll do it by half verse. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the God, I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and praise your name. Because of your For you have glorified your name. And your words are all things. When I called you, you answered me. You increased my strength within me. All the kings of the earth will praise you, O Lord. When they have heard the words of your mouth. <coughs> they will sing of the ways of the Lord. And great is the glory of the Lord. <clears throat> Though the Lord be high, he cares for the lowly. He, he perceives the haughty from afar. 
Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you keep me safe. You stretch forth your hand against the fury of my enemies. Your right hand shall save me. The Lord will make good his purpose for me. O oh Lord, Lord, your love endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being served, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain, for I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Lord, 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 Lord. Once, while Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from there. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long and have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So he signaled his, their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But then Simon Peter saw it. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. When they had uh, brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Creator, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
sometimes uh, as I was listening to the Isaiah passage, the unfairness of the uh, kingdom sometimes gets to me. The angel gets to use a tong with the with the, the coal, but touches the lips of Isaiah. Now, is that fair or what? I mean, that just isn't right. Um, well, both that story and the one of um, of Simon are those of recognition of the uh, awesome nature of God, the uh, tremendum. Um, and, and their unworthiness is the thing that they respond. They are in this tremendous experience and they immediately feel unclean. Um, But just hold that thought. Um, this week, February 2nd on Wednesday, was Candlemas. It's a, actually a feast, a, a, a retreating feast, I would say. Um, not much celebrated in the church anymore, but uh, this springtime before Lent is called Candlemas, meaning uh, candle mass which is a tradition a uh, probably a Celtic tradition and since I am an old Celt I like to remember these things once in a while anyway the tradition is on Candlemas that all the candles for the year are brought in and blessed um, now that's one part of the service there the reason for Candlemas is um, really the celebration of Jesus being presented at the temple. Now, as a, as a good Jew, he was circumcised at eight days, but then after 40 days, he was brought and presented to the temple. I suppose there's some wisdom in that. Uh, if, if the child is still alive at 40 days, then that might be the appropriate time to bring him. In those days, uh, infant mortality was a terrible thing. Um, but he was presented at the temple. And at about the same time, his mother was purified. Um, the, uh, the early Hebrews did not like the, uh, well, they didn't like women very much. <laughs> and uh, so after childbirth, they would be presented and uh, they had to be purified before they could come into the religious life again. Uh, so both of these things are part of the celebration, the celebration of, of Jesus being presented at the temple. He was a good Jew, so he, uh, he was circumcised and he was presented at the temple. And his mother was purified and his parents brought him now this is not the Jesus of the story where he's talking to the to the people. That's he's 12 years old at that point, um, but at this point he's just born. And I think uh, it's hard to know, but um, at this point they're probably still living in Bethlehem. I mean I can't imagine carting a little baby around, um, and. In the story from um, from Matthew, uh, when they go to Egypt, that's they're still in Bethlehem when that happens. So I'm assuming they're in Bethlehem, which is only, after all, a few miles away, not that far from Jerusalem. Nazareth, on the other hand, is way off in the boonies. Um, well, Candlemas, we... Uh, it was in the past a great celebration of the church uh, now in medieval times you have to understand they celebrated all these saints and uh, and Candlemas and, and uh, uh, Holy Cross Day and all of those things 
because the workers got the day off. So naturally, they wanted all of those uh, times off that they could get. But nobody gets them off anymore, so they've kind of receded into the background. But they are still part of the um, joyous um, flesh that is Christianity. Um, I couldn't help but notice that Jesus was by the lake, Gennesaret or Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee. They're all kind of the same body of water. The, he's teaching. And uh, he gets in the boat and sits down. Now, authority in our culture is not projected by sitting down. It just isn't. Um, as a matter of fact, most uh, movie people will tell you that if you want to stop a scene dead, have them sit down in the movie scene, and that's the end of the scene. Uh, I don't know. There are some movies that, that run against that, but, but, the, but the fact is, culturally, we're not used to people sitting down to give us um, their enlightenment. Uh, have you ever seen a motivational speaker who sat down? No. They have their, usually their uh, microphone and they're walking around and they're gesturing and they're, they're really, yes, there's a real sense of energy and authority. And what is that? That's a different process culturally. Authenticity for us is standing up without notes, saying what we're saying. Now, what we're saying might be the same thing that we've always said. Um, politicians repeat, 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 repeat until they get it right, which they never do. And that's the way they work. But the trick there is to, um, you, you can't really memorize something. Uh, people do memorize things and they do well with it, but there's a kind of rope quality to memorization. And uh, Lord knows when I, I don't memorize very well, um, as a matter of fact, I remember being in a number of plays and uh, the directors would get pretty upset with me when I uh, moved away from the, the lines that I was supposed to, to uh, present and, and did a sort of paraphrase of what that was. Um, it kind of messed things up. So I don't have that kind of memory. Uh, I sort of remember themes and then I can sort of unpack those themes as I'm thinking about them. Um, cultural difference. In the first century, if you wanted to show authority, you sat down. If you were Roman and you were feasting, you lay down and ate your feast lying on a couch. Well, I don't even think I can swallow if I lay on a couch, but it's a cultural difference because they were the aristocrats, the ones who were blessed by money and, and power, and so they could leisurely lie on a couch and eat. It's a cultural difference. You know, we make a lot of, uh, uh, about uh, evolution. Uh, and we have Christian groups who have trouble with evolution, but the thing about evolution is it's too slow. I mean, we have basically the same brain and body as our ancestors 100,000 years ago had. There have been a few changes. Obviously, skin color is one of them. We are not, there is no such thing as different races. We're all human. And uh, Homo sapiens is this, the species name. 
Um, and while there are differences, there are certainly um, people who stand out uh, because of either disabilities or incredible things that happen. Uh, we uh, talk about IQs that are high or IQs that are low. Um, we, have, we know about chromosome abnormalities now, um, and uh, they often create a difficulty for living in the world, and we know that those people exist. But the real change in our life is, is cultural. Our evolution is not biological by and large, and, and the people who are always fighting that evolutionary change, um, I mean, think of it. These changes take generations. Uh, you know, with fruit flies, you can have <laughs> 25 generations in a year. Mm -hmm. With human beings, that just isn't going to happen. It's a, and tortoises as well. They live even longer than we do. So, uh, so we have to do something else because we are basically, evolutionarily speaking, hunter-gatherers. We are still running around in the woods with 50 other people, and that is evolutionarily where we are. But that isn't where we live. We live in mass societies. Um, I mean, Harrisonville is not large, but it is large by uh, hunter-gatherer standards. And the only way we can exist in those settings is by cultural change. And our cultures change pretty rapidly. We don't like to think that. I mean, we always think about it in the way that they do in um, uh, Fiddler on the Roof, you know. Tradition! <laughs> That's, of course, tradition is what, we, what we've been doing recently. Um, it, it just, you know, we argue a lot about abortion right now, uh, but there weren't any laws against abortion until the late 19th century. People didn't even notice it because it was part of women's culture. It was taken care of by women, for women, and so nobody and since they didn't pay any attention to women, uh, no, they didn't. Come on, let's let's get into the misogyny of the <laughs> of the patriarchy. They just didn't pay any attention, and so it was under the. And then I suppose at some point the Roman Catholic Church, in its misogynistic best, recognized that abortion was happening and it was killing people, killing fetuses, killing human beings, and so they, they got all had up about it, and then laws start to happen, and the present situation we're in is a cultural change, a fairly recent one, actually. Um, as I say, it was not seen or noticed because it was women's work. Well, we notice women now. Uh, women run things. Uh, women do all kinds of things, and the patriarchy is hanging on by its fingernails, but it is still hanging on. Um, so, cultural change is how we actually evolve. Um, we have uh, same-sex marriage now. I mean, who'd have thought that would happen? Uh, I think of all the things that happened in just my lifetime. Um, uh, we fought long and hard about uh, ordaining women in the 60s and 70s, and now, we, last week we had Bishop Diane Jardine here, the bishop of West Missouri, a woman, and hallelujah for that. 
I was always in favor of women's ordination, um, but I remember in the 70s and the late 60s that that was not a very popular thing. Now, it was a paradox because most of the church was run by women and, and pretty much always has been, uh, at least as a rector. That was something I learned pretty early. And if they, if the, you know, if the uh, altar guild, which was run by women and had all women on it, no longer, of course, but um, if there was something that I thought ought to be different, I just kind of swallowed and kept going because that was a center of power in the community. And it wasn't until the 1970s and 80s in the Episcopal Church that we recognized that women uh, could be leaders in the ordained way. I mean, are we slow or what? I mean, it took two millennia. Uh, you know, I mean, even the, the biblical material, if you read it, you realize those women were pretty important to that early church. And you, you realize when you're listening to Paul's letters that he's basically saying that the women were excited by what Jesus said and how he treated them. And they were excited. And you can see what Paul was doing. He was saying to the women, now just calm down. Calm down, put your hats on and sit quietly. Don't teach. Heavens for fen, you teach. So a lot of the very conservative patriarchs that we have nowadays, uh, we have a few of them around, they're looking at women and they're, they're not realizing how uh, central they have always been to the nature of the church, which is not to say uh, that men aren't important too, but we have these paradoxical situations where um, pretty much what went on in the church was what women wanted to go on. And yet we had vestries that were all men. Um, they were usually married to women and so there was some influence there, but um, it took a while to realize that we needed to do that differently. Um, cultural change, it is, uh, it just rolls along. It just right. That's just one issue. I mean, you just go down the list. There are all kinds of issues. Who knew there were more than two genders? Who knew? You know. But what's happened is, is that people who have more or less been invisible and suppressed because they weren't normal, quote unquote. Uh, they have arrived on TikTok or Instagram or whatever, and suddenly they're there, you know, declaring themselves one of 14 different genders. Uh, you know, I, <laughs> I, uh, I haven't gotten it right yet, and I have no idea, I have no idea what a cis male is. I know that I'm one, I've been called one, so I know that's true, must be true, but what is it? <laughs> uh, but it's okay. We are changing, and change is what comes, and it comes through our cultural life. So Jesus, in his cultural life, sat in the boat. Now, this was smart. Anybody who stood in a boat knows that that's a problem. <laughs> you know, uh, it just is. I remember the first time I got in a canoe and didn't quite maintain my balance very well and went right into the water. Um, you find out pretty quickly that sitting in a boat is a good idea. Uh, but he isn't sitting because it's a good idea. He's sitting because he can give himself a little distance from the people he's talking to. 
and he can sit because he, he, it demonstrates to all of them that he has some authority to say the things he has to say. Now, that isn't the way he would do now if he were here among us. He would stand and he would, again, not use notes, and he would have um, things that we are wowed by simply by hearing them. Um, and it's the only way we can go. We like, as I say, to think of culture as uh, something that kind of resists change, but it's quite the opposite. Um, it is our mode of change. There is no way we could live in the mass society we live in without cultural change. We just couldn't. Because we are hunter-gatherers. And when we get beyond 50 people, we sort of lose the names. We just can't remember who those people are. We are hunter-gatherers, mentally, physically. Now, there are lots of things that have been improved. Um, I remember my dad was an athlete. Uh, he was a swimmer. Uh, but he was of the generation, the greatest generation, uh, that did absolutely nothing once they got out of college in terms of athletic, uh, you know, except for uh, a couple of people who sort of made a lifestyle of it. Uh, I think of, what's his name? Uh, Jack there you go, yeah. right. Yeah, that, those, there were a few of those, and they were amazing in the midst of all of these not so, well, my dad got, he tended to be like me, or I love, I'm like him, I guess. Uh, he put on a few pounds. However, he was also, he could go on a diet, and my goodness, he was, uh, we, you know, when he went on a diet, we just disappeared because he was grouchy. <laughs> but he did, in very short order, lose something like 40 or 50 pounds. And he, uh, and then of course he walked around with all this extra skin for a while. And then it all tightened up and he looked really pretty good. He was amazing that way. Unfortunately, I didn't get that gene. <laughs> You know, it just didn't happen for me. Uh, I just can't pass that plate, you know? Anyway, well, cultural change. It is, uh, it is important. And it is uh, not really talked about in our, we, we look at cultural leaders and we think of them as these old mossy people with uh, I think, when I think of it, I think of, uh, of, a, of an old bearded Eastern Orthodox priest with all the regalia on and uh, <laughs> waving his finger. Um, so when we think of tradition, we think of it as something that's immutable. My goodness, we don't want God to change. But it isn't God who changes, it's us. <laughs> and lots of things have been provided along the way. Uh, for instance, agriculture. It's amazing the changes that have happened in agriculture in order to feed, at this point, seven plus billion human beings. We are in an interesting moment in our life in the life of humans. At this moment, probably something like 90 million people have COVID-19. That is probably the most of any disease ever. And it's just gonna get a little bigger, I'm sorry to say. We're just all gonna have it at some point, um, apparently. Uh, I, I did something I shouldn't have, I suppose. 
I, I went to O'Neill's over on Mission Road, and I just had to have fish and chips. It's been so long since I've been out to a restaurant. And so I went to O'Neill's and I got fish and chips. And my waitress, I, she wasn't wearing a mask. And I said, so you, I said, you've made your peace with COVID. Uh, Cause I came in with a mask and she, uh, she said, well, I've had it three times. I said, three times? Yeah, me too. I was, she said, I was vaccinated. I'm vaccinated and boosted. I still got it three times. And I said, you must work with children. She said, that's exactly right. Um, children, of course, don't get vaccinated and they are vectors, as we would say, in the uh, in the whatever word it is, I can't remember. Um, the point is, we change. And we are in the midst of cultural change. The pandemic has changed us. And uh, it's created resistance on the one hand, but it's also made us understand that uh, these are pretty wondrous things that we as human beings can do. I mean, 100 years ago, people died like flies to, from the Spanish flu. And virology, electron microscopy, DNA sequencing, and a whole lot of, of lab work has been done that made it possible to create a vaccine. And that's probably why some people don't trust it, because it's a newfangled thing. Where did this come from? But culturally, all of those people probably without thinking took their polio vaccine, took their smallpox vaccine, took whatever else was punched into their arms and didn't give it a second thought. But now we, we're growing up, I guess or we're not, we're going the other way. Um, the unity of the American culture is, is not what it was. Um, I'm still reading my book on the Civil War. It's a thousand pages, so I'm on about 730 at this point. Um, the last great battle of the Civil War, which was fought before the gates of um, Nashville has been fought. And John Bell Hood of Texas, for which Fort Hood was named, um, destroyed his army uh, by really poor tactics. But the, he, was, he had replaced Joe Johnston, who kept his army together against the attacking of, of, uh, of Sherman. And so that's, I'm just a little past that now. And there are lots of little things that are happening, but I'm reminded as I read this, how little we as Americans have changed the same stuff is still in the air that we still experience. Oh, we spell it much bigger because more people are involved and much faster because of social media and whatnot. But we're really not all that different than those people in the middle of the 19th century were who fought each other over slavery, essentially. Um, and the, the actually right where I am is Lincoln was reelected. I know that's a surprise to everyone here, but he was reelected in '65, and uh, and then shortly thereafter he was assassinated. Hasn't happened yet. I haven't read that part. Okay.
So, cultural change. It is what makes us who we are because it is the way we evolve. Just think of all the changes you've made in your life. Just think of, you know, stereos and CDs and we've changed all that. And, and how did we do that? Well, we, we changed physically, but we also changed culturally. So what good news is this for us? What makes this good news for us? Well, I'm a progressive, so I'm going to think it's good news, regardless of whether it is or not. Um, but I think it's good news because there is no way we could be 7 billion, soon to be 10 billion on the planet. They, the projection, population projections are that we will, that 10 billion is about what we're going to do. And that beyond that, it's unlikely that we will progress more than 10 billion. Um, but we survive. We survive, as we used to say in the med school, doctors learn from doctors who learn from doctors who learn from doctors who learn from doctors who made it up. That's pretty much how life is. We learn from each other and we live on the discoveries of our wouldn't you like to have the wheel as a patent item? You know, it was so long ago that it couldn't have been patented, but technology evolves, but culture evolves. And it makes it possible for us to live in a contemporary culture. Now, there are a lot of people who don't like that. Luddites, we call them, um, who resist greatly, those kind of things, and thank goodness for them. They slow us down. They make us think about what we're doing. Now, when they take action and start bombing things, well, then we have to deal with them. But, uh, but otherwise, they help us understand the importance of each other in that. We need conservatives to resist change because it helps us make change better. It just does. And we need those progressives to sort of pull us along and say, oh, come on, come on, come on. And that tension is good for us. And it's good for us because it gives us the time and the thought process to say whether this change or that change is a good change for me. And that's where we have to depend on the spirit to be with us and say, mm -hmm. so the church, the church has always changed. The doctrine of the Trinity uh, was not, is not biblical. You can't really find it in the biblical material. It was made up by those who came after. And it wasn't really sanctified until about 300, 325 exactly, at the Council of Nicaea. And that's just what, one change. Now we have women's ordination, we have, okay. And we know once the Roman Church decides to ordain women, that that battle will be over. That probably isn't going to happen in our lifetime. It uh, doesn't look like it so far. But it will happen. <laughs> and we're the test communities. We're trying it out. We're living it. And we're saying, this is the way we need to live. And they're saying, mm, I don't think so. I don't think so. But we are living the truth as we understand it. And that creates cultural change and helps evolve.
well, I said way too much on this subject. Um, any comments or questions or uh, or threats? Is going to be a, a topic of not only conversation but news uh, be in the forefront because this is an election year and we're in the midst of the culture war. At least we're right. told we're in the midst of the culture war. Right. So it'll be on the front page for quite some time. For all year, <laughs> at least, and uh, and we've gotten sort of vitriolic, but you know, we can't get any more vitriolic than the Civil War. I mean, we just can't. And you know, these people who just throw it out and say, well, we, you know, we're going to have a Civil War. Well, think about that. Uh, first of all, I don't really want to fight you over most of these issues, <laughs> whoever you are. And I'll be darned if I'm going to go out and buy a gun, because I know the only people who who get credit for that are the gun companies. Uh, so, you know, I, I want guns to go away. Certainly, guns in the schools. You know, I know they're not supposed to be in the schools, but they show up from time to time. What? You do have them in the vault. Oh, yeah. principles and things are now being taught how to to avoid those situations that's a cultural change you know and you know what does a parent say to a child who comes home and tells them about the kind of you know they're avoiding they're thinking about uh, you know it's, it's like stop drop and roll for avoiding a, if you get fire on you you stop you drop and you roll to get rid of the fire. Uh, those kind of cultural change. How about how many people here can do CPR? CPR. If you had to. I mean, you're going to, yeah, that's about everybody. Uh, some of you reluctantly, but it's, you know, it's what you're presented with. Um, in your life, and we know how to do it because of ER and other television programs. Okay, well, thank you for listening. Let's stand and say our creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God and God, life and life, true God and true God, begotten not made, of the one being of my Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down to heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and then was made human. For our sake, he was crucified and not on the side He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and has seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to God to the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, and the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who the Father and the Son is forced to our hearts. He has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one thing we have in the family of the Father Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world is young. Amen. So, Prayers of the People, Form 6, on page 392. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. 
for all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of our creation, of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, and injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God and His church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. Ted, Donna, Eric, Ann, Maggie, Tom, Glenda, Carol. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. For moisture. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and, and praise, praise your name, name forever and ever. ever. We pray for all who have died that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Good we pray to trust in you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins. Now we demand them. Things done and not done them. And so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in goodness of life. To the honor and glory of your name. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. By the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Six eight six. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave Himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. <laughs>
Directed Prayer A on page 361. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Yes, yes, we give thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, because in the mystery of the Word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we'd fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is I. Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling the death, his death, resurrection, and ascension. We offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. 
And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, Father who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us eat the feast. Hallelujah. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you. Feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Amen. <laughs> Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of our heart. Christ, Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.
peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And thanks be to all of you. Have a good week. <laughs>